Hello, everyone. Sorry we are a couple of minutes late. We can blame the Australian today. Right. Hello, everyone. It's, um, <laughs> it's good to see you all here for our webinar today on um, Can Your Patient Hear You? What Health Professionals Need to Know. And I'm very fortunate today to be joined by Kathy McDonald, New Zealand GP and Clinical Director for Primary Care Surgical Services at Auckland Hospital. Thank you, Kathy, for joining us and all your wonderful wisdom you're going to share with us. Julie Leggetti, who's just, just joined us at the skin of her teeth, um, is the Global Manager of Public Advocacy for Cochlear Limited. And of course, we've got Josie Calcott, who is a nurse um, at Tauranga um, Hospital, and she's also a bilateral cochlear implant wearer. So just as we're about to crack on, just to let you know, this is being captioned like every other webinar we've had, if you've joined us before. There's a little CC icon on the bottom right hand side of your screen that you can either have subtitles across the bottom or the transcript along the panel side. We will be doing Q&A and chat towards the end of, of the webinar. So if you've got any questions or chats, please send them our way and we'll try to answer them as best we can. So what we're going to be discussing today, I'm just going to crack on is um, what we're going to be discussing is some of the challenges relating to cochlear implantation for adults and how healthcare professionals can help identify and refer to with patients. Because over the years, we have heard from clients who have said numerous times that they happen to stumble across information about cochlear implants. They weren't told by the health professional, need that be their audiologist or their GP. And, um, and this is highlighted to us you know, there is an information void on our, on our part, right? So, and there's an area that needs work on. So we're, we're inviting, we've invited the wonderful team today to sort of um, give us their insights, which this will hopefully then form an action plan, to sort of bridge that void and information gap that we've got going at the moment. So I'm going to start off with Julie, um, first off, you know, putting you right on the spot on the hot seat for coming in late. So you're first off, the, first off, to have off the rank, Julie. In our class on following this webinar, Julie, you mentioned that it is not a unique issue that we're facing here in New Zealand about you know, referrals coming through from health professionals and a lack of awareness. So at least we don't have to feel so bad that it's just not us. So would you like to give us a bit of an overview um, of, Julie, of, of how things are globally and um, you know, what's the state of play really? So, uh, certainly, Nick, and um, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to join you from across the Tasman um, today. It's a, a great pleasure to participate in this forum. Um, Nick um, and, uh, and colleagues, please be assured um, the nurses and um, GPs of New Zealand are very, very well regarded, uh, both across the Tasman um, and around the world. Um, the under-recognition of the importance of hearing and the benefits of treating hearing loss is a worldwide public health challenge. It impacts adults more than children. Um, and there are reasons for this, and they are complex um, uh, societal and health reasons. Just to name a few, um, hearing loss is an invisible condition. Um, there's stigma, uh, plus on underconfidence that is often associated with hearing loss, particularly um, in adulthood, that sometimes holds back help seeking. So if a patient is not asking their doctor or their nurse for help with hearing problems, it raises the chance of it being missed, um, especially if the patient is presenting with other health problems. Another reason is that hearing loss has been viewed by society for a long time, um, uh, through many millenniums, as an ev inevitable consequence of ageing, uh, something that um, a person just has to live with, something to be endured. Um, also, um, there's another factor that plays in, um, Nick. GP clinics um, and nurses might be seeing their patients with deteriorating health, hearing health less. Uh, this is because adults living with deteriorating hearing often withdraw and they often self-select and self-isolate in order to limit their interactions that require verbal communication. Um, this includes with their healthcare providers, unfortunately. Um, two other quick things to note, um, hearing tests at the primary healthcare level are not the established norm in most, most countries. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is something uh, and there is momentum growing at the international level um, uh, with which New Zealand, um, uh, cochlear and other hearing care stakeholders are involved. Um, because of the under recognition of um, hearing health, the cognitive, functional and social impacts, not to mention the economic impacts to the individuals, the WHO is really trying to push and inform that regular hearing screening babies, children and adults should become part of um, primary care, um, health inquiries and indeed regular testing. Well, you've raised some very valid points there, Julie. So, Cathy, what is your experience in, in the New Zealand context about awareness amongst GPs for adults? Until I was approached in my role as a GP liaison in Auckland Hospital for surgical, all the surgical directorates, I was not aware that adults could actually apply to have a cochlear implant. Um, mm. I've been a GP 30 years. Um, so anecdotally, I checked amongst the colleagues in my practice, six other GPs and other people I happened to bump into in the last few weeks, and they hadn't heard of it either. Mm -hmm. We were certainly aware of the children's cochlear implant and, um, and the focus on children, the importance of hearing as you're developing. Um, obviously, we knew about that. but. Again, we wouldn't be the referrers for that. The, um, the hearing issues often picked up at birth or soon after um, and through the audiologists, and we're not really involved in that referral process. I think also um, none of us had ever had a patient who'd had a cochlear implant, so we didn't have that personal um, connection either. Mm -hmm. And then I reflected on, uh, we're always going to conferences, we're always having peer review group meetings, we're often spoken to by ear, nose and throat surgeons, and no one had ever raised it actually and, and how is it how much is it a super specialty within their nose and throat actually yeah um so there were lots of reasons for it but of course it's got me thinking too about the role of the patient and um and the patients had never raised it with us either and and thinking back through my practice now of my very profoundly deaf patients i'm going to be raising this but i wonder why they had never raised it with me and i wonder about the audiologist service, do they, how much do they know about the, the referral for this as well? And also highlighting it back to the GP. I think some of the points that Julie has made about the social withdrawal, um, when our deaf, very deaf patients come to us, they are infrequent attenders. They might come every two or three years. They come with a long list of medical issues that need a review. They often come with a supporter mm -hmm. or a translator in effect, someone who can speak for them. Um, and uh, the, the small consult time gets taken up with all those issues. Um, and I see a big role here for our practice nurses. So I'm very excited to be thinking um, how I can be a vector for improving communication, but I would put the practice nurse up there very strongly with the GP. Yeah. And, and that raises something because from our conversations, Josie, that um, Cathy's just mentioned, your own experience with your GP, I think you've mentioned in our conversation, you never really had a conversation with your GP, but the practice nurse played a big part. So do you want to, you know, highlight your experiences, Josie, as a recipient? Yeah. Well, I've, because, you know, I've grown up with a hearing loss all my life. And um, having two hearing aids right up until my adulthood, I've never spoken about my hearing loss with a GP. Um, they've never, um, I don't remember them asking about my hearing loss and I've never brought up my hearing loss to them. It was something that I just accepted. It was just my hearing loss and that's how it is and there's nothing I can do about it. I just accepted it. So um, never even thought to, I always thought of going to a GP um, is to talk about health issues, not hearing issues. Um, so uh, yeah, didn't even cross my mind over the years. Yeah. And what happened at the time, Josie, I mean, you said, you know, when you originally thought about a cochlear implant, it was nearly 13 years before you took that leap of faith. And you shared with us a story last week about, it was actually a conversation with the practice nurse in the GP. Yeah, so, you, you know, it was, yeah, uh, it was, um, I had been recommended it um, by an audiologist um, 10 years prior to this time when I was, um, I, I should say, recommended it again by a practice nurse. I went to see the doctor for something else and saw the practice nurse first and told her about my hearing loss. And um, 
And at that time, I was struggling even more than I had been over the years. And she had an auntie who had a cochlear implant. So that's how she knew about it. And she said to me, oh, you should really consider getting this done. It is just done amazing for my auntie. And the way she was so passionate about it made me go, maybe I should, you know, do something about this. So uh, that practice nurse is the one that made me go to my audiologist and ask about it. Yeah. I, think, I think that's an amazing point. I think, Kathy, we spoke about this last week where, you know, it's um, until a patient hears from somebody else, you don't think about it because you were mentioning about hip replacements. You wouldn't go and get a hip unless you spoke to somebody. Do you want to sort of highlight that sort of, um, yeah. Uh, probably speaking from personal experience of my father putting off a hip replacement because he saw a video of it and um, that was it. No, he wasn't going to do that. But I think most patients wouldn't go and do that if they, that was all that you told them. But if you speak to someone who's had that joint surgery done and how it transforms their life, they can go back to pretty much a normal life and activity from really being in a very painful disabled position. But until they'd spoken to someone who'd actually been and done it, they wouldn't probably consider it for themselves. There's a little bit of that unknown, the fear factor. Um, and then the more people you speak to have had it done successfully, great. It's a no-brainer. And it may not be the GP suggestion or the audio audiologist suggestion that makes you make that leap of faith, but it might be um, someone you meet in a cafe. It might be someone that you bump into a friend of a friend or the aunt of your practice nurse. Um, and then you make that connection. And then, then that's, I think, where we come in. And we need to be repository of some information about how to access the services for our patients. And what would be the key information, Cathy, that... GPs would want to know because I think we discussed this last week as well. You raised some key points. I think that Julie yeah. can then highlight. So, uh, straight off, uh, the information I would need to help my patients with the decision is um, how do they work briefly? How do they work? Um, what's the surgery entail? Um, how long does the surgery take? Is it major? Is it is it minor? Um, who qualifies? What criteria are in place? And is there an age limit? Um, what are the risks of surgery in the, in the Australasian experience? So I think our patients love to know what's going on in New Zealand. Next big uh, country would be Australia. What's, what's our collective experience of the success rate or the risks of the surgery? Mm. Um, and then next, um, maintenance, ongoing costs, and just then the process of referral. Where do I go to for more information? So, so Julie, do you want to address some of those key points and I can take on some? Uh, yes, uh, yes, Nick, and um, I should caveat my answer um, with um, I'm not a not a medical practitioner, so um, the information I'm about to give will be um, quite general. Um, uh, but we will make sure that we provide um, you know pro properly researched and verified answers um, through Kathy Kathy to make available um, to the GP and practice nurse network in New Zealand. Um, if I could first start by um, saying cochlear implants treat severe to profound sensorineural hearing loss uh, that uh, typically cannot be managed effectively uh, with normal high quality hearing aids. So we're talking with cochlear implants about the severe to profound end of hearing loss. Um, uh, there is another type of implant, not as common as the cochlear implant, are called the Baha or the bone conduction implant, which deals with conductive hearing loss. And that treats the moderate um, uh, to profound range. Um, Pindrop has identified um, a series of questions that a GP uh, can ask um, their patient. And I think we'll disseminate this widely to help um, the GP um, know the typical signs of when somebody has um, uh, really suffered a hearing deterioration into that severe to profound end, um, uh, in which case uh, it may be worthy of beginning to um, inquire of the patient um, how um, serious their hearing condition is. Um, I'll just explain briefly um, how the cochlear implant works, just very uh, basically, if I may. So um, there are um, a few components um, to the implant. It's a surgically implanted device um, that um, provides a sensation of sound. 
And there are, broadly speaking, uh, two parts to the system, external and internal. The implant is placed just under the skin. And I'm sorry if anybody has a visual issue, I'm going to point to the area. So not near the brain, is, as is commonly a fear um, of patients who don't have the information, but it's placed somewhere just uh, above the ear, um, under the skin. Uh, the implant has, um, an, it's a flat and small disc-like um, uh, uh, implant, and it has an array of electrodes, which are placed inside the cochlea by a specialist um, ENT surgeon. External um, to that implant is a processor. Processor is typically worn behind the ear, or there are um, uh, very easy to, easy to um, uh, attach devices that sit above magnetically. They can be placed underneath the hair, for example, or on the, on the head, and, and um, they're so small these days, won't be seen. But the process is outside, um, and this enables the sound to be collected um, by a very, very small microphone. It then transmits um, the sound to the impl implant through the electrode. There's a digital coding de or decoding that allows electrical signals through the, um, the implant, the electrodes, and then uh, to stimulate the hearing nerve, nerve fibres. Um, and these are relayed uh, by way of sound signals to the brain and they produce hearing sensations, which the magical human brain then interprets uh, into sounds. Um, so I hope I've done a, a, a very, um, uh, I hope it's a serviceable job of giving the visual, but they are two parts um, and, and that's how it, it, it works. Um, would you have me add anything else there, um, Nick? No, I think that's covered it really well, Julie. Thank you. And I think some of the questions as well that, you know, I think Kathy mentioned, what are the, the risks? And again, me and, and Julie, we're, we're not surgeons. And I think whenever you would have a meeting with your surgeon, they would go through them. But, you know, I mean, it's a low risk surgery, you know, as far as surgeries are concerned. Like this is what Bill Baber and Michelle Neef, both cochlear implant surgeons were sharing with us in their webinars recently. You know, near the, near the site, you might have a bit of bleeding and swelling. There is a small risk of maybe some vertigo happening and maybe some tinnitus. Um, in some cases, because they're quite near the facial nerve, you can get a bit of temporary numbness there as well. So as I said, but the surgeon will go through all of those with you. But, you know, generally it's, um, it's a very well tolerated um, surgery. But, you know, the surgeon would definitely go through any risks and concerns that you would have when you got to that point. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I think, you know, with funding in New Zealand and referral, you know, you would, you know, refer at the first point as a GP, you would refer to an audiologist. Now that could either be you would discuss your client if you want to go for private or public, because I mean, again, it's like anything, if you go on public, there will be a wait to see the audiologist. In private, you would see one quite quicker. And most clients would probably have an audiologist in private already. Um, and most, because if they've already got a hearing loss, they would probably already have an audiologist, um, unless it was a sudden loss due to injury or, or disease. And, um, but I think if it is in private, you know, you've got to have the conversation. It's that you're being referred because you may be eligible now for a cochlear implant to say that up front. you know, if the GP's had that conversation with you already, because you don't want to be put into, if you've got a severe loss, profound loss, to put into another hearing aid, which may be of no benefit to you. You, you know, it's really, if it, the cochlear implant's gonna be a benefit, it's that conversation you want to have. In New Zealand, we have 40 implants publicly funded for adults, which admittedly is not a lot. We're constantly building the case to government, the, the trusts in New Zealand, both the cochlear implant trust, North and South, are always building the case for more funding. And, um, the only way we can build the case if there's increased need. So the referrals still need to come through, even if the funding is tight. You know, it's much better to have someone referred in than not. And, um, and it's better they're fully informed of their choices. And um, because if they're clinically eligible, they will go onto the waiting list or there's other discussions that can be had. Um, yeah. Um, so. um, Nick, can I um, just add um, one other um, 
one other comment um, to to Cathy's questions, um, and, and it was the question of um, reliability, which um, I'm, I'm not able to directly answer, but I can say that this is a form of, um, it's a device and a form of surgery, which has evolved now over 30 years. So even though um, it's relatively, um, it, it, it's um, under-recognised um, as a treatment for severe to profound hearing loss, and part of today is about raising that awareness, um, it is now a very evolved form of treatment, um, uh, conducted um, usually by um, a very um, experienced um, and a relatively small group in New Zealand of, of specialists. Um, the other question was one of age, um, and um, I guess a common myth is um, uh, that um, you know there's a, there's there's an age at which um, both hearing aids, cochlear implants, well, you know uh, the patient um, is is considered too old, but um, they really have, and I think those. Um, uh, specialised ENTs that are involved in this field would say um, the decision on age absolutely depends um, on the health of the particular patient, um, the motivation of the patient, um, and how much they are suffering from depression, um, um, isolation, um, uh, and other potential comorbidities from not being able to hear. So it's very much um, an individual assessment. And I did want to very briefly share with you one uh, very beautiful anecdote uh, from here in Melbourne. Um, and that's um, the case of Dulcie, uh, Mrs. Dulcie Selleck. Um, and I'm going to read uh, to you what she said uh, on her 100th birthday. Uh, mm. And her surgeon decided because of her great desire to hear again, to give her an implant um, at the age of 98 years. Um, Mrs. Selleck said on the occasion of her 100th birthday, I'm sorry I put off having this done so many years ago. I was pleasantly surprised that the operation was not as bad as I thought it would be, and I'm much happier now. I enjoy going out with my group of ladies and joining fun and frivolities. So um, that, that is um, certainly the oldest um, cochlear implantee uh, that I know of, but there were personal circumstances and her personal motivation um, uh, persuaded her and her surgeon uh, that even at the age of 98 years, it wasn't too late. Now that's again at the, um, the outer age range that I know of, um, but just to give an, an indication about the sort of factors that um, the specialist uh, may, may consider. So well, thank you, Julie, for that. That was really good. Cathy, do you have any comments on, on that? Yeah, a great story and great to hear that there's no age restriction. And I'm thinking, you know, years ago, we might have thought cataract you had to live with and part of being older was you were going blind. And now we would fully accept everybody having their cataracts done. Um, so uh, I guess there's some analogies there. And um, I think it's, it's a really good news story and, and I can't wait to spread it, actually. <laughs> and, 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 on, and on that, um, Cathy, it's like you mentioned previously what some of the reasons you think GPs aren't aware but also some of you mentioned some of the patient characteristics as well, a thing that Julie sort of tapped into as well. Why, why, um, yeah, why they're not aware of what do you think we should be doing to get the information out there to break down those barriers? What's your thoughts as a GP? Uh, I think it's a good, good case for direct to consumer uh, information um, spreading and there's lots of hearing associations and their, their magazines and conferences that they have. Um, I think uh, from a GP perspective, I'd love to see some posters in our waiting room. I'd like it to see it on our waiting room TV, where mm -hmm. we have a lot of articles and people sitting there. And it might not be the actual deaf patient who sees that, but it might be a relative or a close friend. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd like to see it promoted more. I think um, now that I know about it, I'll be certainly finding out more about it and promoting it amongst my colleagues um, and raising it with my patients. I think now... I've, I can see I have a role here. Previously, I thought really that the deafness was, um, I, I had no skill in that, that I had to leave that to the patient and their audiologist, but maybe I have a part to play here in the bigger picture. Yeah, I, th I think it's the start of that conversation, isn't it? You know, and raising it, you know, with, because the client might not realize if they haven't had, they've been living with the loss and not realizing 
their hearing is getting worse. Because I think, Josie, you mentioned that when we spoke last week, you found that quite hard because you didn't realise your hearing had gone down until somebody had said you'd had your next test on. You found that quite challenging? Yeah, because I was so accepting of what my hearing was anyway. So it was just how it is. But um, it wasn't until I had the hearing test um, that um, the audiologist noticed a significant drop and uh, when she told me I was absolutely devastated so yeah and it's it's funny because I was just you know listening to you Julie about how you were talking about that lady with that 98 year old here I was thinking at 38 I left it too late <laughs> but um and I wished I'd got it done earlier because I would have had more of a um you know more opportunities in life um if I had got it done earlier but I'm so grateful that I've got it now. So, yeah, I think um, uh, it wasn't until um, I had that hearing test. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. So, and, you know, you were describing what it looks like. I could show you just on my ear. So, this is what it is. Oh, yes. That's really yeah. your choice, so. Yeah. Mm. Did you, could you see it? Yes, it was good, yeah. Yeah, yeah so both sides yeah and have you found Josie like the, the bilateral because I've known a couple of clients now I've wanted to speak to you that's going on what Kathy said about the patient to patient you know experience it has so much value because of some clients wanting a bilateral now that because the government pays for one taxpayer funded but you've had your second one your friends Fry County fundraise for you to get your second one but people are now wanting to speak to you about the bilateral and if it's worth it so and how's those conversations been for you as an advocate? Um, for, um, well, yeah, so because my friend saw such, such a significant change in me with the first cochlear implant, um, I had the odd comment, you should get your second year done. And I would brush it off because it was so expensive. No way, there's no way I could do that. I'm so happy with my one, I'm so happy. Um, but, you know, over time, I had friends that kept on saying, you should, you should really consider a second one. We'd fundraise for you, they said. Um, and when I had a third person say to me, we'll fundraise for you, I thought, oh, gosh, that, you know, maybe, maybe. <laughs> and so um, I said, well, why don't we just see what happens if we have a, a meeting? So we created a first meeting. Um, of, you know, we basically put a message out there on Messenger to a whole lot of people and said, this is what we're thinking about doing. If you're interested in helping, come along to this meeting. So we set up a meeting date and I had 12 people turn up um, or so about that. And, um, and it was just day one. And then we said, okay, we need to raise 50 grand, let's do it. And we walked out of that meeting going, ooh, 50 grand. Um, but we started off, we hit it off with a movie night and um, that was two grand in the bank. And um, I, one, of the, one of the girls in that group, you know, she said, that's two grand closer. She was so optimistic. And we just worked at it all the way through and we made our way to 50 grand. And yeah, so I think the fact that they saw such a big change in me and that with that first implant, they knew that having a second one would, um, you know, finish it off nicely. Um, they said, would you get given glasses with one glass or would you get g given glasses for two eyes? Um, so that's how we thought, you know, that's how they, that's how they sort of saw it. Um, and it is, it is just like that. We need two years to hear. And I think for you, Josie, you like you work in a busy hospital, and I think you have noticed a difference having the bilateral, especially now with COVID that's just been with everybody wearing masks as well, which was quite challenging. Um, yes. Yeah, you found it. Yeah. Yes, when I heard about when I heard on the news a couple of weeks ago about the overseas they've created masks with windows in them, I cried because I thought that would just make a difference for so many people. Yeah. Covering their mouths is like is like walking in the dark. It's, it's, it's awful having, and it's hard enough. Just last week, I was trying to communicate to another nurse who was uh, in full PPE with a mask on, and I struggled. And I, when I don't hear like that, I really go into panic mode because 
Um, it's just my history of not being able to hear. You start to panic inside. Um, but later on, when I said, I really struggled to hear through that mask, she said, everybody does. All normal hearing people struggle to hear through a mask. So that was quite reassuring. But yeah, yeah it does make a difference having two cochlears. My work, my working is just so much easier. And I suppose the panic, Josie, comes from the miscommunication that arises from not being able to hear properly and the embarrassment. Was, is that part of where the panic has stemmed from? Um, and about, yeah, yeah, it is. It's, 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 when, you, when, you, um, when you're saying pardon, if you say pardon and you get, that, you get people repeat and then you say pardon again and they repeat, and you have to say pardon a third time, and they start going, oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, or, or they repeat and they shout. Uh, you know, you, you get different kinds of responses, but most of the time it's an impatient reply or, um, or anger or something like that. So when you have a history of getting that kind of response, you really start to panic because you don't want to be such a nuisance to have to say pardon again. Um, it, it, it does, it stresses, it's very stressful, very. And I suppose that's what you have found, Cathy, with some of your patients. You've mentioned previously where they would come with a partner into the clinic, they're quite shy and reserved. It would be all of those factors that Josie's probably mentioned. Yeah, and um, I can't think where the, the issue of the hearing's ever been raised. There's always the other things that we talk about, so be much more aware now. Yeah. I see you have a question there for Josie. Someone's posted a question. Oh, hold on. I'll, I'll... Yeah. Um, I think, um, oh, weird. What? I can't see the question. Question, question I'm, I'm... at the bottom. Q&A. So, hi, Josie. What sort of frequencies are you receiving from each individual cochlear? For example, do you have high frequency in one and low frequency in the other? Now, that's a good question. Um, I did that with hearing, I had that with hearing aids. I definitely had very different frequency when I had a cochlear in one and a hearing aid in the other. Um, the cochlear would give me majority of sound, but the hearing aid did give me something that I couldn't quite get from a cochlear, which was a very, very low frequency. Um, um, however, when I turned the cochlear off, and listened through the hearing aid, um, I wouldn't hear very much except those low frequencies, which wasn't really important sound. When I turned the hearing aid off and listened through the cochlear, I would get those high frequencies and I would hear all the important sounds. And so now that I've got both, they, are, they, they don't quite marry up because I have an old cochlear in one ear and a new cochlear in the other, so an N7 in one ear and an N6 in the other ear. And so they both work slightly differently. And um, sometimes it seems like one ear works better, better than the other, but I still, can't, I still can't say which one works best. Yeah. All right, I think we've got, I'll take another, I think I've got a, um, we've got something on here. Oh yes, so, uh, this is a good point. It's about funding, Cathy. I think where, where we broached, we, where I was talking about um, public funding earlier, there is also private funding available through Southern Cross. But with um, private health insurance in New Zealand, they do not cover the device. They cover the surgery and the specialist. So you have to cover the price of the unit, which is different from Australia because Australia's health insurance covers the whole law that covers the device as well. I think in New Zealand, the health um, insurance companies see it as an appliance. I think that's been the sticking point. It's not an appliance, but um, yeah, so uh, you can get your private health insurance to um, cover it as well. So I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna throw open a broader question to each, to all three of you. So based on the insights you've all come with today from Julie's perspective, Josie's and Cathy's, what in your view can we do to address awareness amongst, and you've already sort of mentioned this, but we'll summarize each of you, uh, your key points. Um, what can we do to raise awareness among primary health care? Like from a grassroots level, from consumer, of, you know, what can we do from your point of view, Josie, from the health community, um, Kathy, from yours, and then from a global and a societal perspective, Julie. 
So if we want to start off, we'll, we'll start off with you, Julie, and then we'll work our way through. Thank you. Um, thank you. And look, I would I would make one uh, one comment. I think um, I think Kathy might have um, alluded to it, but um, you know, society does get a lot of its information from the media, and uh, it was mentioned that um, very little is uh, known amongst the um, um, primary healthcare professionals and GPs. I think when cochlear implants um, do receive media attention, um, it really there really is a focus on um, you know the, the soft and beautiful stories of the child and the babies uh, being switched on and hearing when um, we know today that there are literally um, millions of people around the world who are, who are adults and older adults who um, could benefit. So media and and public relations and so on does have an important role um, in raising societal awareness generally. Um, and I'd like to come back to what, what's happening um, uh, around the world and we hope uh, will be happening uh, in the not too distant future in um, uh, New Zealand and here in Australia. But look at the grassroots level, um, um, I just, uh, I would like to say, because it's so relevant to this forum, that the importance to the patient of receiving um, the information in a timely way, um, not years after they've suffered isolation and depression and confusion, but getting that information from their GP or their practice nurse, if they're not getting it from their audiologists, where we would hope they were getting it, um, but getting that information about options um, so that they don't feel um, uh, hopeless. Um, it will lead to empowerment. Uh, it will lead to encouragement for them uh, to address their hearing health um, so that they can ask their audiologists um, with confidence um, the right questions. So the first thing I'd say at the grassroots level, this is a very exciting opportunity um, uh, to raise awareness amongst general practitioners and practice nurses in New Zealand, who, um, as happened with Josie, uh, was in a position to inform and empower Josie um, to make some inquiries that in the end were life-changing for her. Um, it's especially the case uh, uh, for those people with hearing, hearing loss for whom hearing aids are no longer enough um, uh, and, uh, and no matter how high-powered they are, can't help. At the macro level, um, the WHO says um, that it's time, really time for awareness raising and advocacy about the importance of identifying and treating hearing loss, not just cochlear implants and um, bone conduction implants, uh, but whether or not a person needs a hearing aid um, or other forms of, of support, it's time to raise awareness in society about the benefits, um, the health benefits, prevention of depression, isolation, prevention of falls, prevention of a range of co um, comorbidities that have, have been identified um, uh, that, that are with people who have hearing loss. Um, individuals, families, communities, um, and primary healthcare professionals, um, uh, we, we, we hope um, we'll begin, and I'm, I'm about to give you some, some, some very stark figures that I hope will be persuasive, but also at the level of government, um, government decision makers and policy makers. Um, the WHO is hoping uh, to get the attention of governments through a, re a report that was going to be released this year, but for COVID-19, it's been delayed um, to next year. Um, the WHO will be releasing the first ever um, World Hearing Report. That is um, a call to action globally uh, to bring attention of all governments around the world of the need to invest in the hearing health mm. um, of their populations. And I should say the New Zealand government uh, way back in 2017 supported this action uh, at the WHO level. Um, if I could provide a few figures just to show how big this problem is, and Nick, I'll let you talk about the New Zealand problems, but just to show um, why at all levels of society um, we want to work together um, to take action on um, prevention of deafness and hearing loss. Figures released by the WHO in 2018 estimated that worldwide 466 million um, are suffering from disabling hearing loss. So not moderate levels, but disabling um, levels of hearing loss. That's over 6% of the world's population. 
um, only 34 million, sorry, I shouldn't say only, it's a huge number, 34 million of these are children, um, the, the, the rest of adults are, are adults, the vast majority are adults. And the prevalence um, arise, is rising primarily because of the ageing population, but also because of noise-induced hearing loss. And the WHO set, has said to governments around the world, if action is not taken to prevent and treat hearing loss, that by 2050, this number, 466 million, will double to over 900 million people. And this has economic consequences all of the health and social mo um, social consequences. Uh, it places pressure on welfare systems for people that can't work because their hearing loss is un unaddressed. So there's there's a lot of reasons. Um, and the final the final thing I would like, um, if if I may, Nick, is to read a very short quote. Um, yeah. But when the WHO released these figures, they said, "Hearing loss can no longer be ignored as a health priority." We know it affects a third of older people. Evidence reveals it will significantly impact the, the individual's health. It will in, impact systems of society. Uh, it will in, impact our economies as people live longer. So there's a real societal call to action at the macro level, as well as a need to take action at the individual level to save the health consequences and the limits on, on, on adults of working age, for example, um, to work. Um, and COVID-19, I have to say, really brings into focus the need to keep people with hearing loss connected, connected to their work, and if they're older and no longer of working age, to enable them to communicate online uh, with their doctors, um, uh, with their health providers, and to stay connected with family and friends. And that's a very valid point, um, Julie, because being in lockdown and in isolation, when you've already got a communication challenge and you're already isolated and lonely, it exacerbates it even more. Kathy, following on, have you comments to add after that, um, those um, key points from, from Julie? I, th I think the numbers are impressive and um, are quite concerning. Of course, we're living longer as well, so we'll get that old age uh, loss coming in as well. Um, yeah, I think it's raising awareness, isn't it? Um, like mine's been away, uh, raised <laughs> hugely in the last two weeks. And looking into it, there's really not a lot in our GP's normal um, communications about it. There's nothing in Health Pathways and there's nothing in um, Health Point. So I'm very enthused to go back to my role at Auckland Hospital and start working on a pathway with Mish Neal, who I'm meeting on Friday. And we'll start the process of, of getting this backdrop of communication there ready for the GPs so that when we do a raise this, raise this with people and the patient might come in and ask about it, at least they've got a go-to place to go to and get up-to-date information, which... Um, which would be good. And that was a huge light bulb moment to us. I mean, I, I by default, I just assumed it would be on health point. <laughs> you know, and I just assumed like, yeah, <laughs> like, and, and this is where we've gotten so much clarity, Kathy, from speaking from you about areas that we need to address for that point, starting off with health pathway and, and health point, yeah. you know, and then, you know, um, hospital TV, which as you mentioned is another one. And then the waiting rooms. So there's areas where we can really address the, you know, from information to consumers and information to GPs. Yeah, and um, remembering uh, that a GP is pretty overloaded with information. Being generalists, we have to know a little bit about everything. We're not experts in cochlear implant, but we need to know enough to know to recognise the patient who would benefit and how to ease them into the system on offer. And I'm pleased that we've got public funding for some, and maybe with more referrals, there will be pressure to get more public um, public ones done. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure there's a big unmet need out there, a big unmet need. Well, I think there is. I mean, I think, uh, Cathy, the waiting list at the minute sits around 200. So we've, all, we've constantly been having those discussions with trusts, both trusts, as I said, with ministry. And I think, you know, they are aware, they have been supportive. I, you know, it just hasn't materialised into the recent budgets, unfortunately. But I think, you know, with the unmet need and more referrals coming through, it's, you know, it becomes really quite crucial and vital that the funding need gets met and gets met soon because as Julie highlighted, those numbers are staggering. 
and the impact, as Josie's mentioned, you know, from a class perspective, it, the, the impact is huge of, of living with a severe hearing loss and it not being addressed because you've nowhere else to go. It's not like you can refer back in and go for another option. Your cochlear implant is your last hope, really, in this instance. Um, Josie, have you comments to make, you know, about how um, consumers can help at a grassroots level? Yes, I think um, those who have experienced the, um, ha that have received a cochlear implant could be, um, could help by telling their GP about the experience and how it has been for them. That would be helpful. Um, um, I, I don't, yeah, I think, I don't know if I've, I'm just trying to remember if my GP that I have now knew me before I had hearing aids. I don't think they did, unfortunately, because I had moved towns. But if my GP knew me before and then got to know me afterwards, they would have seen a, quite a significant change. So um, I think for, for people like me, I'm a nurse as well, so I can spread the information through patients at work and um, just talking to doctors, especially when they say, oh, what's that thing on your head? then I can tell them about it. There's lots of house officers that come through, so I can tell them about it. Um, if, yeah, um, and I, I think them seeing what I'm doing as a, you know, working as a nurse and functioning normally um, with very few frustrations is, is, is a good way to show what difference it makes in your life. Um, so, yeah. I just think all the recipients should try and spread the information, uh, spread the, just show, how do I say it, show um, others how great it has been for them. Yeah. And as you said, I think as Cathy mentioned before, it's as, re as well as raising awareness with the GP, Josie, helping other patients or other clients come to that decision when they've spoken to somebody. It's not, you know, so scary. You know, I mean, you took a leap of faith because you heard from the practice nurse. So the power of that conversation from another patient, and as Cathy said, when it came to hip replacements, when you speak to somebody else, the decision becomes a lot easier to make. It's um, when you've met somebody else um, who's had the procedure and how life-changing it's actually been to them and how successful it's been. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I think collectively we're, we have quite a bit of work to do, and it's a thing has been a good starting point to get an action plan together you know, to work forward from here, from this point, to start breaking down those barriers that, you know, and those information voids that are there. And um, I was just going to throw it out to those that are um, joining us today. Have you got any questions while we've got um, Kathy, Julie and Josie here? Or, or does the panellists have anything else they'd like to add at this point while we're waiting on people? Uh yeah, I do. Um, I because I had this person ask me a question and um, just talking about our experiences. Um, you find me on Facebook. I'm very happy for people to private message me um, if they want to share experiences with me. Um, you just look up Josie Calcott, um, on, or you could also go to, go to Josie's Cochlear Implant Journey. Um, that's on Facebook and that's an open public page. I'm happy to be approached if you want to talk about anything oh thank you Josie I mean that and you've been really good at, at speaking to community groups and everything and you've done quite a few media stories and shared your story quite publicly and it's been it's been really great at, you've been such a great champion um, of, of um, sharing your story and, and advocating for CI you've made such a difference to many people already so we do thank you for all the work you've been doing and, uh, and Kathy and Julie so, Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I'm so grateful. That's why I'm so grateful. So, so grateful. That's why, I, that's why I'm happy to help. Oh, thank you, Josie. Julie, Cathy, any sort of final points? Go, Julie. Oh, Cathy, I was going to... Um, but look, I, I did want to, I, I guess, refer back to one of Cathy's, um, Cathy's points. Um, uh, it, this is um, uh, awareness, awareness, awareness. Um, I think it's a message I'm taking from the whole, uh, this whole um, discussion. Um, GPs and their practice nurses have so many, um, uh, you know, health issues that they have to be able to identify and get across. Um, 
and so um, the more that we can collectively do um, to make um, straightforward information available so that they can um, empower their patients um, with knowledge um, when they do identify that there's a problem. Um, but it's awareness at all levels of society. Again, um, uh, Josie has talked, I think, very, uh, very eloquently about the role that um, cochlear recipients can play, um, you know, also bringing to the attention of their GPs um, uh, what's worked for them and what's what's really helped them. And I did want to just, if I may, give one anecdote again to reinforce the point that this is a worldwide problem. Um, that there's um, very, very few things um, in New Zealand that are not problems elsewhere in the world. Um, there was a wonderful initiative by um, a group of French cochlear recipients um, that I was told about quite recently. They're in a loose association, a peer support group, where they were doing their bit um, uh, to inform society about what a cochlear implant is and who it can help and, of course, how it had helped them as individuals. And they decided in an organised way that they would each agree that every time that they went to see their general practitioner, no matter whether, whether it was about another health condition, um, they would make sure that they spent a minute or two um, telling uh, their GP about their cochlear implant or if their GP didn't know about the cochlear implant, um, allowing their GP uh, to ask them a question or two. So it's just a, a, just a nice anecdote to reinforce how this is iterative. Um, GPs and practice nurses can really help um, by be becoming informed about the issue of hearing loss, um, what to ask, um, how to tell the signs, uh, when a cochlear implant might be um, something that um, a patient needs information about. But patients also, because we're really trying to raise awareness in society and GPs and practice nurses can't know everything um, uh, that, that the cochlear implant recipient or the family member can also do their bit to help raise the general awareness levels in, in society. Oh, thanks, Julie. And Kathy, any closing comments? Yeah, I really agree with that, Julie. And um, I think uh, as long as the GPs, in our usual way we search things, have we've got cochlear implants set up there in our usual connections that we make, the usual places that we look, I think, yeah, that, that's what I would like to achieve. And um, But I would really love to see the, the, the patient raising it more with us. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Well, hopefully we will achieve that. Look, I think it's, um, I don't think we've any questions come through. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for your time this morning. It's always, you're always preparing. It's just not coming on and spending an hour with, with me on a given morning it's, or an afternoon. It's, it's the preparation that was in beforehand. It's the insights we've gained has been tremendous. It's been very insightful and I'm really looking forward to working on an action plan moving forward to, you know, create better awareness and bridge that void that's, that's out there. And, um, yeah, so I'd like to th say thank you all so very much for joining me this morning. And now the afternoon, or there's the afternoon. It's, I'm lost. Yeah. It's a Thursday. Thanks. <laughs> it's really Friday. <laughs> Pleasure. Yeah. All right. Um, th 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 thank you from Australia. And um, thank you, Kathy, Josie, and Nick, for inspiring my work day over here. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully it, it's, it's another it's a productive one, Julie. And, um, we look forward to seeing you all very soon again. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Ciao.